presencia comandante está viva, está lozana en la vida. I feel something in life, not just a great interior force, but also the power to transmit it to others. It's a fatalistic sense of my mission, which frees me from all fears. Ernesto Che Guevara. Firme y clara, comandante Che Guevara, del ejemplo de tu vida. Comandante, comandante, comandante Che Guevara, aquí seguimos queriendo la aurora profunda y clara de tu presencia gigante. Ernesto Guevara de la Serna was born in Rosario, Argentina, on the 14th of May, 1928, a day on which Ernesto would never celebrate his birthday. There's a different date on his birth certificate, the 14th of June. With a white lie, his parents had decided to hide a pregnancy out of wedlock. His mother, Celia de la Serna, was the heiress of a family of landowners related to the aristocracy of Spain and the New World. A rebellious girl with aristocratic grace, in Buenos Aires, she was one of the first women to wear short hair. She drove a car, signed checks, and crossed her legs in public. His father, Ernesto Guevara Link, was a pleasant and good-looking young man. He was mercurial, like his great-grandfather, who took part in the gold rush in California. He was exuberant and very imaginative. The Guevara family were different. They were chaotic, generous, and intellectually restless. Ernestito, little Ernest, as he was nicknamed, spent the first two years of his life in an immense garden, until one day in the spring of 1930, a day which was to have a significant effect on his future personality. On the 2nd of May, 1930, after bathing in the frozen water of a swimming pool, he suffered his first asthma attack. It was the beginning of a problem which over the years would force him to forge an iron-like determination. In 1943, the De La Cernas moved to Buenos Aires and Ernesto started high school. World War II was still raging in Europe and his parents supported the solidarity movements for the fight against Nazism. But Ernesto had yet to become involved in politics. I didn't get involved in community activities during my adolescence and I didn't take part in political or student campaigns in Argentina. Deeply affected by the death of his grandmother in 1947, Ernesto decided to study medicine at the University of Buenos Aires. Exempt from military service because of his asthma, Ernesto, the student, played tennis and golf but excelled at rugby. He played for Estudiantes of Córdoba with the nickname Fusel, an abbreviation of the Furious de la Serna. With his natural enthusiasm, Despite his asthma, he became the leader of the team. He also found a magazine called Tackle, and his byline was Chanco, Pig. He liked to boast that he rarely washed himself, and that he once wore the same rugby shirt for 25 weeks in a row. He took up a position as a nurse on a tanker, worked in the communal slaughterhouses, and then at the university library. With a companion, he invented an insecticide, which he hoped to commercialize. At the same time, he took up an interest in politics. It was the natural result of his readings, and perhaps 
because of the turbulent times he was living in. The succession of coup d'etat, the rise of Perón in Argentina, and so on. So Ernesto started frequenting a group of Marxists at university, but never joined the party. University disappointed him. He was looking for a vocation while they were talking about a career. During the university vacation, he decided to visit his friend, Alberto Granado, on the Sierra to the north of Córdoba. A medicine graduate, Alberto worked in a leper hospital in San Francisco de Chanar. Ernesto fixed an engine to his bicycle to make the 850 kilometer journey. The only things he took with him were a spare tire, a few clothes and a book. Cuba, March 2nd, 1952. Military coup d'etat. Backed by the United States, Colonel Fulgencio Batista took power. The island was nicknamed the Brothel of America. Gambling, prostitution, and cabaret. Cuba became a playground for rich Americans. Foreigners controlled the entire economy of the island. Strongly Americanized, the capital city, Havana, became relatively prosperous. but huge shanty towns surrounded the capital. It was a completely different reality. 50% of the population was illiterate, and the people in the countryside lived in the most absolute conditions of hardship and poverty. Pillaging, corruption, Batista was an unscrupulous dictator. A man of the United States, he was the guarantor of their interests on the island. At the end of his holidays, Ernesto returned to Buenos Aires. He crossed the bush and often shared the life of the gauchos. Ernesto was 23 years old and had almost finished his studies in medicine. Hungry for discoveries and adventures, Ernesto decided to undertake another initiatory journey across the whole of Latin America with his friend Alberto Granado. On December 29, 1952, they got onto an old Norton motorbike nicknamed La Poderosa, the Mighty. As they were leaving, his father dropped his revolver amongst his son's equipment. Dr. Granado and his assistant, Guevara, passed through Chile as they crossed the Andes. The Norton motorbike was already breaking down. They hitchhiked as far as Valparaíso, where they secretly boarded a freighter. They went up towards Bolivia, and visited the enormous mines exploited by the United States, which revealed to them the enormous socio-political injustice in the treatment of South American workers. Their journey continued towards Peru, Lake Titicaca, Cusco, Machu Picchu, and then in the direction of the Amazon, where they arrived at the San Pablo Leper Hospital. That aimless journey around our America changed me more than I thought. After traveling together for seven months, the two friends separated. Ernesto had just one dollar in his pocket and promised his mother, Celia, that he would return home to finish his studies. The freighter that took him back to Buenos Aires was forced to dock in Miami. While he waited for the ship to be repaired, Ernesto Guevara had to survive for 20 days with just one dollar. He completed his doctorate in record time. But Dr. Guevara didn't care a bit about this prestigious title. He couldn't wait to set off again. Ernesto arrived in Guatemala, where something new was happening. 
President Jacopo Arbenz, a progressivist military man, had promised a vast program of reforms. The most important idea was that of bringing to an end the existence of larger states and nationalizing the properties of United Fruit, a very powerful U.S. company. With the support of the Eisenhower administration, the local oligarchy was against the idea. Along the way, I had the chance to see the United Fruit properties. Once again, I was convinced of how terrible these capitalist octopuses are. I will improve myself and acquire what I need to become an authentic revolutionary. In December 1953, Ernesto settled in the capital and met several Cuban exiles who had taken refuge in Guatemala after a failed insurrection attempt led by Fidel Castro against the Batista regime. Led by a young Cuban lawyer, Fidel Castro, they tried to capture the Moncada barracks. The armed assault resulted in carnage, and their leader was captured and condemned to 15 years in prison. In remembrance of the Moncada assault, the group decided to call themselves the 26th of July movement. June 15, 1954. The Eisenhower administration gave the go-ahead to Operation Success. This was a CIA plan which financed the opposition to the government and trained a paramilitary force to invade the country. The situation precipitated in the space of a few weeks. Jacopo Arbenz resigned and left the country in the hands of a new military government loyal to American strategic interests. These were dangerous times for supporters of Arbenz's progressivist government. Ernesto decided to move to Mexico, where his life reached a turning point. While Cuba was rocked by the student protests against Batista's corrupt regime, Fidel Castro was unexpectedly freed from prison and immediately joined his companions in Mexico. July 7th, 1955, Mexico City. Meeting Cuban revolutionary Fidel Castro was a political event. An intelligent boy, he's very sure of himself and is extraordinarily courageous. I think there's mutual respect between us. When Ernesto met the volcanic Fidel, it was love at first sight. Castro was looking for a doctor to join the group of revolutionaries that would land in Cuba to overthrow dictator Batista. Guevara didn't think twice. He will carry out the revolution. We're in perfect harmony. Only for someone like him would I give all of myself. At that time, Ernesto was financially dependent on Hilda Gadea, a woman who belonged to the left wing of the Peruvian party, which was there in exile. Just after he met Fidel Castro, Hilda told Che that she was pregnant. He wrote in his diary that he would marry to keep her dignity. From the 15th of February, 1956, I am a father. My communist soul expands in an excessive manner. The baby girl came out just like Mao Zedong. At the moment, she weighs less than Mao, but she will grow. At last, Castro found a boat to reach Cuba. The Granma was an old cabin cruiser. On board, there were 79 Cuban revolutionaries and three foreigners. Globe-trotting Argentine doctor Ernesto Guevara, Dominican Ramon Mejias, also known as Picirillo, and Italian Gino Doné, who was fleeing post-war unemployment. Everything was ready for departure. December 2nd, 1956. It wasn't a landing. It was a shipwreck. The 82 people who landed on the Cuban coastline were decimated by the initial skirmishes with the army. 
the dozen that survived hid in the Sierra Maestra, a massif 130 kilometers long and 50 kilometers wide. Up against a 4,000 strong modern army, the guerrillas established relationships with the campesinos, peasants, which progressively boosted their ranks. It was our baptism of fire, the beginning of the formation of what was to become the rebel army. Right during the shootout, I found myself in front of a rucksack full of medicine and a crate of ammunition. The weight stopped me from taking both. I took the crate of ammunition and left the rucksack. In battle, Ernesto Che Guevara found his missing part. He discovered he was unafraid of dying and played a fundamental role in the development and survival of the rebel army. One day, a spy among the rebel army was discovered. It was one of the peasants who had voluntarily joined up. The traitor was unmasked and condemned to death, but nobody was prepared to carry out the execution. Che volunteered himself and wrote about it in his diary, describing the size of the wound caused by the bullet and how the bullet entered and exited the man's brain. He wrote about how calmly he slept that night without asthma attacks. Without any advance notice, Fidel named Ernesto commander. It was the highest military position in the rebel army. There's a bit of vanity inside every one of us. This appointment made me feel the most important man on earth. From that moment, Ernesto was known by everybody as Commander Guevara. With his men, Che installed a radio transmitter and the typography of a newspaper to spread the word about the actions and conquests of the rebel army. Radio Rebelde brought the voice of the revolutionaries to the whole island. The message was simple, freedom or death. Commander Guevara set up an out-and-out -out arms factory which produced bullets, grenades, and even a homemade M26 weapon, which was thrown from a catapult constructed with the springs of an underwater fishing gun. Inside the liberated zone, the rebels paid for their purchases with coupons signed by Ernesto Guevara. Che was a visionary, a mystic, while Fidel was a pragmatist, a realist, and an obstinate politician. Che had no political or diplomatic ability. He didn't mince his words and made enemies in next to no time. If he didn't like someone, he told them directly. He was combative, ideological, and really did think he could change the world. In the summer, Fidel Castro's guerrillas left the mountains and took their fight to the plains. Commander Guevara's column took control of Ladvias province. The island was now split in two. It's very, very difficult to advance. Our comrades' physical conditions are worsening, and eating now and then certainly doesn't help to improve the miserable situation we find ourselves in. It was in this region, considered a starting point of the revolution, where he met his future companion. Aleda Marsh. She was a young and very beautiful woman who joined the secret 26th of July movement in Santa Clara. Aleda arrived at the battleground where she found Che Guevara and spent several days there. They became lovers in the mountains. By Christmas, the war was practically won. Only the city of Santa Clara, the cornerstone of Batista's defense, was still to be taken. 
December 29, 1958. The battle commenced. Guevara's column besieged the city. The regular army drew up thousands of soldiers and an armored train, which the dictator considered his secret weapon against the revolution. Machine guns spat death from the turrets. Suicide squads doused them with petrol. The armor plating became an oven for the soldiers, who decided to surrender. They all surrendered in just a few hours, with their 22 wagons, cannons, machine guns, and fantastic ammunition supplies. At dawn on January 1st, 1959, Fulgencio Batista fled to the Dominican Republic, taking with him a veritable fortune. He left the country in the hands of a military junta, which uselessly proposed an armistice to Fidel Castro. The rebel army was already marching towards Havana. January 3rd, 1959, Commander Guevara's column entered the capital. Popular enthusiasm was overwhelming. Several days later, Fidel Castro made his own triumphant entry into Havana. The revolution of the Barbudos, as everyone called the Sierra rebels, had won. Che was nominated military governor of the Cabana Fortress which faced Havana. It was also where the revolutionary courts were set up. It was here that Batista's executioners were put on trial. With his consent, Che became supreme prosecutor. Hundreds were summarily executed after the trial. Ernesto Che Guevara was just 30 years old and already a legend. The foreigner, the Argentine as they called him in Cuba, would soon receive Cuban citizenship thanks to a clause in the new constitution written especially for him. Primero de mayo, principios que fueron, lucha del obrero, que ser... Together with a few trusted companions, Guevara worked on the creation of a secret service for the security of the state. On Fidel's orders, he prepared the agrarian reform promised to the peasants by the revolutionaries. He was nominated Minister for Industry and found himself leading the ambitious Cuba industrialization program. To set up an industrialization process, Cuba must first recuperate its natural resources, which were given to foreign consortiums by the Batista dictatorship. And we must be prepared for the reaction of those who today control 75% of our trade and market. Guevara had clear ideas on the path to take to assert the revolutionary ideals. Redistribution of land to the peasants the end of the sugar monoculture, nationalization of foreign enterprises, central planning of the economy. The social programs included a massive literacy campaign. 
Trains transported thousands of volunteers from all over the island who wanted to learn to read and write. In 1959, 40% of Cubans were illiterate. It was a spectacular march which was supported by UNESCO. Disarmed to avoid any form of criticism, the allegorical army danced and sang to the rhythm of the slogans which demanded free education for all, which would also guarantee national unity for a long time to come. Guevara was also appointed president of the National Bank of Cuba. His capacity for work became legendary. From time to time he wrote to his parents. Dear folks, it's 6.30 in the morning and I'm taking a break. It's not the start of the day, but the end. On the other hand, we are the future and we know it. We build with joy, even though we've forgotten our nearest and dearest. After divorcing Hilda Gadea, Che married his new companion, Elida Marsh, who would give him four more children. June 12, 1959, Che left for the first of his long trips as worldwide ambassador of the Cuban Revolution. He traveled extensively in search of new diplomatic and, above all, commercial relationships. Strict with himself, he decided to leave Elida at home, but regretted it and wrote to his mother from India. I have to talk about political and economic problems. I take part in receptions where I even have to wear a dinner suit. On top of all this, I'm without Elida, who I couldn't bring because of the many mental complexes I suffer from. In the meantime, in Cuba, the nationalization of foreign enterprises and agrarian expropriations continued to develop. The United States became increasingly worried about the progress of relations between Cuba and the Soviet Union. Differences with Washington became increasingly clear. It was the most serious attack ever on Cuban soil. On March 4th, a French freighter laden with ammunition exploded. The weapons were bought from Belgium. Eighty people lost their lives. Fidel Castro accused the United States, which immediately denied responsibility. Two weeks later, Eisenhower approved a secret plan to overthrow Castro. There was widespread speculation about the United States' hostility towards the harsh methods used by the Cuban Revolution. These images fueled the Cuban anti-Americanism and Fidel took advantage of the situation to justify his policy. Cuba assumed the image of the victim and gradually, in the name of national security, the revolution changed face. The Americans radically reduced sugar imports, which provoked a reconciliation with the Soviets. On October 19th, the United States imposed a trade embargo against the island. Three days after the announcement of the American embargo, Che Guevara left for his first journey to the communist bloc countries. He had to assure the sale of Cuban sugar and to obtain credit for the construction of new factories. In China, he was welcomed with full honors. On the airport runway, Vice President Zhu Enlai received him. But it was in the Soviet Union that Guevara stopped the longest. He visited Moscow, Leningrad, and even found time for some sightseeing. He met an infinite number of people, soldiers and workers. He watched a performance at the Bolshoi Theater. He met Nikita Khrushchev. He was even invited onto the Presidium balcony in Red Square to admire the military parade on November 7th.
In the meantime, the atmosphere in Cuba had changed. The state now controlled banks, education, transport, industry, and agriculture. The humanist face of the revolution had become tougher and well-off Cubans left the country. The anti-castrist front widened. Opponents of the revolution reorganized. Old soldiers of the Batista dictatorship, landowners and rebel officials of the army. In all, there were 3,000 men. Officially, they were all United States agents. On April 15th, the CIA bombed the airports in Havana and Santiago. Seven people died. The already meager Cuban aviation lost five aircraft. It was a time of plots to assassinate Castro. Attempts to subvert the new Cuban power with the support of the CIA. And the disastrous expedition to the Bay of Pigs endorsed by the new president, John F. Kennedy. In Havana, heavy artillery was positioned along the Malathon seafront, while 35,000 people were accused of hostile acts against the regime and were detained by the police and revolutionary defense committees. The CIA was hoping that an anti-castrist insurrection would favor invasion. It didn't turn out that way. August 1961. At Punta del Este in Uruguay, a conference of the Organization of American States was held, and Guevara did everything he could to be noticed. He sent a message to President Kennedy via American journalists. Thanks for Playa Giron, the Bay of Pigs. Before the invasion, the revolution was shaky. Now it's stronger than ever. The United States delegation, head speech, was vague and without substance. Guevara had brought the Cold War to Uruguay and attacked the United States. Se medite sobre la responsabilidad internacional que tiene el gobierno de un país que autoriza y facilita el entrenamiento de mercenarios para atacar a Cuba. The reference to plots financed by the United States was crystal clear and the consequences were just around the corner. America stopped all aid to countries maintaining relations with Cuba and several months later, the Organization of American States expelled Cuba. In the meantime, another of Guevara's battles began. He promoted the creation of a new socialist man role model. He called it the new man, an unselfish and solid figure prepared to give everything for the community. As a demonstration, he launched the volunteer work experiment. Y para la sociedad, como aporte individual y colectivo, y va formando esa alta conciencia que nos permite acelerar el proceso del tránsito hacia el comunismo. After the Bay of Pigs, Castro was convinced that the United States was preparing to invade Cuba, and he asked Moscow for military protection. Whose idea was it to install nuclear missiles on the island? Castro's or Khrushchev's. The Cubans said it was the Soviets, and vice versa. Che began to realize that the Soviet Union was a country full of defects, and he felt increasingly frustrated in dealing with them. He wanted to build a steelworks in Cuba. He wanted the Soviets to help Cuba develop the spirit of socialist egalitarianism and solidarity among comrades. 
he wanted to be supported in his idea of creating the new man, the true communist, and he wanted Cuba to be free at last. He failed to accomplish any of these things, and a conflict arose between Che Guevara and the orthodox Cuban communists that backed Moscow. October 1962. In Cuban waters, there was the threat of another world war. It was the missile crisis, and the Castro revolution realized it was a pawn in a very big chess game. For Guevara, it was the sign that something had changed. His initial enthusiasm for the Soviet model had faded. His economic objectives never took off. With his idea of a new socialist man, he was considered utopian. He no longer felt indispensable in Cuba. Guevara felt that the need to return to the battlefield of the worldwide revolution was stronger than ever. On December 11, 1964, the Cuban revolutionary was in New York, representing Cuba at the United Nations General Assembly. Cuban exiles welcomed him with extremely violent protests. Guevara had arrived to announce another campaign of revolutionary battles, and the tenor of his words left no doubts. February 25, 1965. In Algiers, he spoke about the Third World. He made a very harsh speech. He accused socialist superpowers, China and the Soviet Union, of applying principles of capitalism in commercial dealings with developing countries. It was his last public speech. The development of countries that are at the beginning of their path to liberation must be paid for by socialist countries. Socialism cannot exist without a new fraternal attitude towards humanity. Che was no longer under any illusions. His great challenge was underway. Fiercely determined, he set out to show the world what proletarian internationalism really was. In Cuba, his life seemed to continue as before. Few knew that he was about to leave, that he might never return. In the meantime, Fidel Castro adopted a cautious stance. In public, he talked of Pacific coexistence, while in private, he said, if Shea could plant the revolutionary flag somewhere else, he'd leave him free to act. Guevara left several farewell letters. One of these was for Fidel. Reclaman el concurso de mis modestos esfuerzos. Aquí dejo lo más puro de mis esperanzas de constructor. I leave here the purest of my hopes as a builder and the dearest of those I hold dear. I carry to new battlefronts the faith that you taught me. En los nuevos campos de batalla llevaré la fe que me inculcaste. El espíritu revolucionario de mi pueblo, la sensación de cumplir con el más sagrado de los deberes, luchar contra el imperialismo donde quiera que esté, esto reconforta y cura con creces cualquier desgarradura. April 1st, 1965. Ernesto Che Guevara left for Africa. Three weeks later, he reached the Congolese shores of Lake Tanganyika, where he met an unexpected reality. No one has the slightest idea of what a firearm is. They shoot while playing with their weapons or because of carelessness. 
disagreements within the anti-government movement stopped Guevara from organizing military action. Weeks, months of inertia followed. After seven months of almost no fighting and the frustrating impossibility of training the local soldiers, Guevara made a bitter and self-critical analysis. I learned a lot in Congo, and I left with more faith than ever in the guerrilla fight. But we failed. November 22, 1965. Che left Congo and secretly returned to Cuba, but his mission to liberate oppressed populations was not over. He soon decided on Bolivia. A military junta had just come to power. Clashes, protests and demonstrations were inflaming the country. The CIA thought he was in hospital in the Soviet Union. With the help of the Cuban secret services, Guevara transformed himself into a middle-class 40-year-old. He wore thick lensed glasses, he was half bald and his eyebrows were thicker. To seem shorter, he took out the insides of the heels on his shoes. With roughly 50 men, he tried to set up a training base. On November 7th, the men built a tunnel to hide provisions and materials. Instead of supporting the guerrillas, the Bolivian Communist Party launched a dissuasion campaign. The situation is not good. But a new stage of testing begins for the guerrillas, and it will do us good if we overcome it. Months passed in pursuit of and escaping from the army, which seemed to be everywhere. The comrades' losses became increasingly higher. Che was ill. He could hardly walk. He had lost about a third of his body weight. He was emaciated and famished. He was different, no longer as attentive and cautious as he used to be. August 1967. Increasingly alone, the guerrillas tried to flee northwards. They reached the mountains and apparent safety. September 1967, the town of Valle Grande in the heart of Bolivia became the base for the Bolivian army's anti-guerrilla operations. Commander Guevara moved into the open with few precautions and apparently without a plan. His diary entries at this time are addressed to a Leda. They seem written by a man aware that he's marching towards his own end. The best bullet of this pistol, which has always accompanied me, the indelible memory of the children that one day you and I conceived, and the fragment of life that remains of me, I give this to the revolution. Nothing which is capable of uniting us can ever have a greater power. September 26th. The guerrillas arrived in the village of La Higuera, a piece of land between two mountains where there were only women and children. The peasants had fled after being warned of the army's arrival. The guerrillas were ambushed by the army. Three comrades were killed and two wounded. On October 7th, Commander Guevara was optimistic and wrote what was to be the last page in his diary. It has now been 11 months since the start of the guerrilla movement. It's a day without problems, bucolic. There were 17 of them left, 
That night, Che picked up a Chilean radio station. There were 1,800 Bolivian soldiers looking for them in the mountains. October 8, 1967. Surrounded by two companies of Bolivian rangers in the Churo Gorge, Che Guevara was shot in the leg and captured. A bullet had destroyed the cylinder of his rifle, and Che couldn't use his weapon. With arms extended, leaning on two soldiers, the most wanted man in the world was led to the village of La Higuera, where he was imprisoned in a school. Che Guevara slept on the floor of the school during the night between the 8th and the 9th of October. His hands and feet were bound. The bodies of his friends lay next to him. October 9th, at 12.30, a radio message from the Bolivian High Command in La Paz read, Proceed with the elimination of Senor Guevara. The order was signed by the president of the Bolivian military government. A meeting took place to decide what to do with Che Guevara, and it was decided he must die. The order was transmitted in code to CIA agent Feliz Rodriguez. The agent entered the room and said simply to Guevara, Commander, I'm sorry. Sergeant Mario Terranzi volunteered to carry out the order. It was 10 minutes past one in the afternoon. With a semi-automatic pistol, he fired at Che's arms, legs, then chest. It was October 9, 1967. Ernesto Che Guevara was 39 years old. The bullet-riddled body was fastened to a helicopter skid for its final journey. When it arrived at Valle Grande, the eyes were still wide open. The soldiers called a photographer to immortalize the moment. The first journalists and onlookers arrived. Before long, a veritable procession of people had begun. Some of them secretly cut off small locks of his hair as good luck charms. News of his death broke in Cuba. The radio reported that Commander Guevara had died from battle wounds. Fidel Castro was doubtful. He didn't want to believe it. October 15th, Fidel received the photos of Che Guevara's corpse. Now he had proof the reports were true. In an emotion-filled voice, he addressed the Cuban people and passionately remembered his fallen comrade. De corazón digo que ese modelo, sin una sola mancha en su conducta, sin una sola mancha en su actitud, sin una sola mancha en su actuación, ese modelo es el Che. Si queremos saber cómo deseamos que sean nuestros hijos, debemos decir con todo el corazón de vehementes revolucionarios, queremos que sean como el Che. Mortal, a nuestro guerrillero heroico.
heroico. Thirty years after his death in Bolivia, the remains of Che Guevara were returned to Cuba. With the regime rhetoric that he so disliked, the Cuban population paid homage to him. The romantic image of the revolutionary, his face and his words have become part of popular imagination. Legend has consigned him to history as forever young, forever a rebel. Ernesto Che Guevara conquered death. He knew he would. He knew it the day he said to the soldier who came to kill him. I know you've come here to kill me. Shoot. You're only killing a man. Ahora esta más anónima, esta América de color, sombría, taciturna, que canta en todo el continente con una misma tristeza y desengaño, ahora Esta masa es la que empieza a entrar definitivamente en su propia historia. La empieza a escribir con su sangre. La empieza a sufrir y a morir. Porque ahora por los campos y las montañas de América, por las faldas de sus sierras, por sus llanuras y sus selvas, entre la soledad o el tráfico de las ciudades, en las costas de los grandes océanos y ríos, se empieza a estremecer este mundo lleno de corazones con los puños calientes de deseo de morir por lo suyo, de conquistar sus derechos, casi 500 años burlados por unos y por otros. Porque esta gran humanidad ha dicho basta y ha echado a andar. Y su marcha de gigantes ya no se detendrá hasta conquistar la verdadera independencia por la que ya han muerto más de una vez inútilmente. Ahora, en todo caso, los que mueran morirán como los de Cuba, los de Playa Girón. Morirán por su única, verdadera e irrenunciable independencia. Che's old friend, Dr. Alberto Granado, has many stories. Most of all, those of the legendary motorbike trip for thousands of kilometers around South America. When we left, we wanted to discover Latin America. We didn't think that there were such serious political and social problems. Reading his diary, 50 years after that journey, 
It's clear his life revolved around the figure of Ernesto Che Guevara and the Cuban Revolution. When I went to see Che in Cuba the first time he was president of the National Bank, I asked the secretary to announce me, and the reply was that Commander Guevara couldn't be disturbed because he was studying financial mathematics. Gino Donet, the Italian who boarded the Granma, arrived in Havana in 1952. He did many jobs. He was enlisted by the Cuban resistance and was assigned the dangerous task of taking money to Fidel Castro, who was in Mexico preparing revenge against Cuba. He had an Italian passport. His jacket was stuffed with dollars, and he shuttled between Havana and Mexico City. In 1956, Fidel bought the Granma. At sea in stormy weather, it was the same for Gino as it was for everyone else. He suffered a bit less than the others because he was used to sailing. The landing was disastrous. They fled and shook off their pursuers. Ernesto Guevara had an asthma attack, and Gino made him kneel down and massaged his shoulders and neck to bring him relief. Aquí, Sierra Maestra, el primer territorio liber de América. Aside from romantic aspects and rhetorical films recounting the first months, it was a real new revolution fought for concrete freedoms. Freedom from hunger, illiteracy and disease. It was a singing, dancing revolution, a sunny revolution, not grey and bureaucratic and oppressive like the real world of socialism at that time. 